Good afternoon. So it is my pleasure to introduce you another speakers uh, from Portugal, originally from Porto. I really love this city. Uh, Felipe P. S. Cruz. Uh, Felipe or P. S. Uh, he's very uh, active in demo um, at the demo scene since uh, 1997. So it's almost 20 years. So, okay. So welcome, P.S. here, and enjoy the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Did everyone go to eat? <laughs> uh, well, I'm here to tell you guys about the demo scene and the net audio scene and how they are related between uh, each other. I assume you guys already know about the demo scene. but I'm going to focus more on the music groups of the demo scene and how they relate to this thing called the net audio. So a little bit about me, uh, I was born in 1979, uh, when I was six I got a ZX Spectrum, I learned to code on the Spectrum, uh, ten years later I, I had a PC and I heard about the demo scene, so I started doing some demo scene stuff. Uh, in 1997 I started coding some demos, which all sucked, uh, in 1998 I actually released the demos, they still sucked. Uh, but I started doing this uh, weekly newsletter thing called uh, Demo Journal, where we had reviews of uh, demos and also music releases that happened at the time. So I got into what the scene was releasing and getting a bit uh, into it. Uh, I also started doing music uh, with uh, Just Call a Buzz, and then I ended up joining uh, Scene.org as one of the staff members. And one of the responsibilities I had at Scene.org was to approve new music uh, groups. Because you had to submit, if you wanted a directory at Scene.org, you had to submit a zip file with uh, two entries and uh, prove that you were, you were really demo scene related, uh, so you would get a directory. So I knew a lot of music groups, I was in direct contact with them a lot. And then I founded my own net label in 2001 called uh, Enough Records. So this is why I know what I'm here to talk to you about. So the topics for today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the demo scene is, if you don't know already, which I assume you do. I'm going to talk about the tracker music formats, uh, why they popped up, what's interesting about them. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, music groups, what they were and how they ended up uh, turning into these things that are nowadays called net labels. So let's get started. Uh, so the demo scene, as you guys should know, is an underground computer culture. Well, maybe nowadays it's not as underground anymore. It started around the, the 80s. Uh, it was a spin-off from uh, cracking and piracy scene. Uh, people wanted to do more uh, legal things with their uh, releases, so they started doing compos for that. And it's about doing real-time visuals on computers. So. Um, the thing with the demo scene is that back then, at the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s, there was a lot of uh, floppy disk trading. And uh, floppy disks, for those who are born uh, not so recently, uh, or not so long ago, as those little thingies about this big, they had only 1.44 megabytes. So uh, you had to be careful of what you used on the space. You couldn't just send one gigabyte of information to other people. Uh, there was also BBS trading. Uh, people also sent stuff by mail. They asked for the stamps back so they could send more for free, things like that. Uh, but the thing is about the music in the demo scene, the song data had to be really small size because we had to send these floppies. The download would take a lot of time, so they had to be small, otherwise people wouldn't want to download it. And that's how tracker formats ended up being uh, happening in the scene. To send a whole wave file of the complete song was a huge waste of space, so you broke it down to small instruments and samples, and you packed a whole song there, and you could send those songs as tracker formats. Uh, and according to Wikipedia, uh, it says that trackers are music sequencer software used to create and edit module files. And I, I don't think I can describe it much better than this, so I just left it there. 
Uh, it looks a little bit like this. This one is Impulse Tracker. Uh, for those who don't know the tracker uh, standards, there are slightly different versions of trackers, but most of them have uh, three simple uh, schemes. You have uh, usually a screen where you say what samples you are using or what instruments you can do with those samples. Uh, you have a pattern or a set of patterns of uh, what channels you can sequence. Uh, this is an example of a pattern editor. You see the several channels are each one an audio track. Um, and then you have a sequence a sequencer of a sort where you say what patterns you are playing at uh, what time. Uh, and this is pretty much the basis of all the tracker formats, but then there were a lot of different trackers and a lot of different formats, so it just became a mess. Uh, the tracker formats were originally popular with the Commodore Amiga. Uh, there was Ultimate Tracker, Noise Tracker, and Pro Tracker. I don't know if there is any other more famous, because I wasn't in the scene back then, so any of you guys, if you think I'm missing one, please speak up and uh, let me know. Uh, then they grew a bit more popular in the MS-DOS PC era in the beginning of the 90s, first with Scream Tracker 3, released in 1990, then with Fast Tracker 2. Uh, there was a very strong rivalry between Scream Tracker 3 and uh, Fast Tracker 2, and then Impulse Tracker came out, and uh, the rivalry became between Fast Tracker 2 and Impulse Tracker. Uh, trackers still live on nowadays. Uh, we have some software which is still used and updated. Uh, Renoise is a great example. It's based on the tracker format, but you can use it with VSTs and other kind of stuff. Uh, we have ModPlug Tracker, which is a more traditional looking tracker, uh, which is also still getting uh, recent updates. Um, then you have Jaskola Buzz, which is still being developed. It's slightly a different format from the original trackers, but you can still make music with it. And it was originally based on the tracker formats. Uh, you have a few others, Schism Tracker, which looks a lot like Impulse. You have Milky Tracker, so you have a lot of them. But these are the most known ones, let's call it that. Uh, if you're interested on the history of the tracker formats, I found this great SVG. I'm actually going to try to load it. And it really it tracks down all the history of the tracker since the beginning. And it has a list for all the platforms. So this guy, I think he's Japanese or Chinese, he's Asian guy. He just tracked down all the trackers, all the dates of releases, all the authors, and he made this huge timeline. And you can just scroll through it if my mouse would allow it. Yeah, it shows you the Amiga, where it started. And then you have a bunch of other trackers. This is when uh, the ultimate sound tracker got created. And you can go through it, and you can see when the trackers die, when they merge together. It's awesome. It's a bit uh, hard to see the whole picture, because you have to scroll around. But it's a really great resource. Uh, and yeah, so I, I recommend you guys check it if you're interested on the history of trackers. So, uh, tracker formats. There were shitloads of them. Uh, these were the most famous ones. You had dot .mod, which is more popular from the Amiga modules. Uh, they're usually four channels, but they can have more. Uh, Scream Tracker 3 used the .s3m format. Then Fast Tracker used .xm, and Impulse Tracker used .it. And uh, if you look for modules uh, on the internet nowadays, these are probably the formats that you'll find, and they are more easily replayable. Uh, so what was interesting about the tracker formats? They were a completely open format. And this was back when uh, there were no big issues with copyright. Okay, there was copyright in the sense that piracy was being hunted down, but people didn't really care about if your music was getting stolen or not. They just wanted other people to listen to it. So they don't really enforce it that much. Uh, there was no DRM, so you could send your tracker format. There was no way to stop another person from uh, extracting information. They could always extract the samples, the pattern sequence, they could always remix it. And uh, I personally thought that was great. And nowadays you send the MP3 and it's very hard for you to do a remix out of that. Um, what, it, what happened to compensate for this 
openness was that uh, the trading of the tracker formats was mostly a community meritocracy. So wh what does this mean? Was the community would give merit to a certain uh, person who would get a reputation, and when that person had a reputation, his tracks would be a lot more traded than the other ones. If a guy ripped the other guy off, claiming the track was his, people would shame him. Okay, no, this guy is, uh, is a faker, and they would spread that information and the guy would be denounced as a fake artist or a bad artist. Uh, it was also very selective trading because of the limited sizes and uh, bandwidth that you had, so uh, it evened out. It was a natural selection of which tracks are worth uh, trading and which ones are not. Uh, nowadays it's no longer so, um, but I will get to that uh, later. Uh, so back then, uh, we had tracker formats and we had these things called music groups, which they were basically a group in the scene or part of the scene, but they were focused exclusively on music. Um, they were related to the demo scene, sometimes they collaborated with demo scene groups, sometimes they made demos as well, but they made packs just exclusively with tracker music. Uh, some people might be uh, fame, uh, might be uh, uh, inside this information, others might not, but they existed. And uh, nowadays people with the net audio uh, scene don't really know that these tracker groups existed. Um, anyways, they were related to the demo scene in several ways, to the Ashi and Nancy scene, uh, to, the to the demo scene itself by doing music discs. Sometimes you would send a pack and it would have an interface you could uh, play your tracks from. Um, and it was a way for them to spread their own digital art. They had small releases, as I mentioned. Uh, they would send it on the BBSs, they would be traded on floppy disks. Uh, sometimes they would uh, remix or do covers of um, uh, famous pop songs. Uh, they had original works as well. Uh, sometimes you had a lot of references for soundtracks for video games. You could go through the mod file and you would see uh, sample text saying, if you want music for your game, send me an email to this address or, or, a, or an actual postal address for people to contact them. And then came MP3 and the internet, and that changed everything. Uh, MP3 um, was a way that became very popular very fast, and as the internet showed up, uh, it became faster to transfer it or as the internet progressed, let's call it that, people became, started having more bandwidth. Because when we all had modems, the speed to trade an MP3 would take like five hours to get a two megabyte file, it was crazy. So you, you didn't want to spend your whole day just downloading an MP3. Uh, but nowadays everyone has fast connection, and as it started booming in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, a lot of groups started turning into MP3s because they, had, uh, they could do mastering that you couldn't do on the mod tracker formats. They had uh, higher quality. Uh, well, it, it's debatable if it's higher quality because MP3 is a uh, lossful format. So, uh, but yeah, they ended up releasing more MP3s than original mod tracker formats. Also because people, uh, musicians, didn't necessarily do the tracks in tracker formats only. They could use Logic or other audio making tools that were out there. And then appeared net labels. So net labels are not necessarily related to the, dis to the demo scene. Uh, their purpose is only for to do digital distribution, uh, have the tracks free for download. So these are uh, labels that work, and their modus operandi is we release all our catalog for free, come and download it from our site. We are a democracy for the music industry. We don't like the, the concept that you should only be selling. We want to distribute our music for free. This is the, comp the concept of the demo scene, of the net label scene. Uh, so some net labels derived from music groups and others did not. Others did just boom, they showed up out of nowhere and uh, they started releasing stuff for free and they started coining the term net label because for a lot of years we just called them music groups. So, um, as I was saying, the net labels uh, became sort of a democratization of the music distribution. Uh, there were, one of the phrases that uh, you hear a lot is that the net audio was killing the music industry, you know, like the piracy scene had been doing for, before. 
uh, the point was that uh, it was more about discovery of new music and not of distributing uh, mainstream music. Because the main problem with the music industry is that uh, you need it to be accepted by, you need to be profitable for anyone to publish your work. And that was the biggest bottleneck that artists were feeling. And internet helped resolve that. Because now you can just put a track online, people will just go there, you can just uh, copy paste the link, send it to your friends, put, post it on Facebook, and people will go there, listen to your music, download it. They don't have to wait for a guy at uh, Sony or whatever to approve that your music is worthwhile distributing. You can just talk directly to the fans and uh, see if it's worth or not. And uh, this gave rise to a lot of interesting issues. First, it uh, did an explosion of different niche genres, stuff that would never sell. Artists didn't care about that, they just wanted to make their own music, so all these niche uh, genres started popping up, uh, especially in the experimental electronic scene, uh, a lot of small IDM, experimental IDM, uh, which was not commercially viable, but people really enjoy listening to it and it became a lot easier for you to meet other artists that also do that kind of sound or to find an audience for that kind of sound. Um, it allowed direct indie distribution, as I mentioned before, and you had this uh, boom also of curation and radio re-emerging because all of a the sudden there was so much music around that it was a, a lot more important uh, that people would pick the best ones for you. Uh, which is a bit of a contrasense of wanting the liberty from the music labels, but uh, well, that's, that's what it is. People are lazy to just download everything and listen everything. They want to get a direction at least. Um, and at around some point, Creative Commons appeared. And Creative Commons is actually, I think it was born in the beginning of 2000 or 2001, somewhere around there, but it wasn't very popular. It only became more popular around 2005, something like that. So there were net labels releasing tons of music that did not use the Creative Commons uh, label. And they were still mostly okay with people just remixing and reusing their works. Uh, but Creative Commons helped uh, solidify what options are available, what is allowed and what is not allowed to do with the music. So it really, it, it, it became very connected to net audio uh, the Creative Commons licensing scheme of a sort. So what has happened was that there was a huge boom of net labels. Uh, most of them had very uh, short lifetime, just one or two years. They do like 12 releases and they just disappear completely. Ten years later, their pages are offline. You can't find the releases, so they're, it's like they never existed unless you remember or you downloaded all the tracks. There were a lot of net labels like this. Uh, but lots of them still persisted. Um, it's hard to count how many net labels are actually active. There was a study done in 2012 that counted 350. Uh, there are more than that for sure, uh, because I was part of that survey in, in 2012 and I knew that the guys doing the survey missed a lot of them. So I would say at least 400, 500 would probably be closer to the truth. Um, what the survey revealed was uh, that uh, most of the net labels were focusing on either electronic music or experimental music or a mixture of both, uh, which goes along with the uh, niche genre explosion that I mentioned before. But uh, quite a few of them also did uh, more uh, radio-friendly uh, releases of uh, rock stuff and pop stuff and indie and those kind of uh, genres. Uh, there were also several festivals that happened dedicated to net audio only, uh, at least five or six of them. Uh, they stopped growing in interest at some point because people just realized that music is music and it doesn't make much sense to have that distinction between what is completely free and what is not completely free. Um, and yeah, it's hard to have a current uh, estimate on how many net labels are active today. Uh, a good uh, point of uh, analysis is that there is this event called the Net Label Day 
that happens every year for this is the, the third year that it's going to happen in 2017 and uh, each year there were around 130 net labels participating i don't think this is the, all of the net labels that exist probably like half of it but it's it's a good measure to know how many labels are out there at least um, but yeah, out of all of these ones, only a very small percentage are directly related to the demo scene. Um, my net label is one of them, because I, I, I am from the demo scene, I do stuff on the demo scene. So Enough Records was founded in 2001. I will actually open the web page, just so you guys can see. And we had, if the internet was working, yeah. Okay, so we have a shit ton of releases. It's a very basic website. It just shows the covers of all the stuff. And if this would scroll. Yeah, you can see we have shit tons of releases going all the way back. So yeah, it's a lot. Uh, so we have 396 albums, actually 397, we really released a new one last uh, weekend, I haven't updated this slideshow yet. Uh, about 20 compilations, a lot of mixtapes, uh, so yeah, I was one of the founders in 2001 uh, with two other guys from Portugal, the other two other guys got bored of it after a year or two, but I persisted, so now we have... Uh, the label still running and uh, yeah if you make music and you want to release it on a net label you know send me an email and I'll take a listen and tell you if it's good enough for a release on enough records or not um, yeah other active net labels uh, that are really t uh, related to a uh, demo scene or have demo scene background I found these there are probably more at least one or two more but uh, I, I looked these up uh, and my my definition of being active was that they had to have a release in 2016. There are other labels who were only had releases in 2015, which are related to demo scene, which I did not include on this list. So there are more, which I, I believe would be around. But at least these have been still releasing stuff, and they either had the founder was a demo sceneer, or uh, most of the releases, or, or most of the release artists are demo sceneers, or a few of them at least. Um, so yeah. So you can see that there are not that many. Out of 130, this is like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So it's about 10% of uh, 130 or 12%, something like that. So yeah. There are other commercial labels that are also related to the demo scene. I know at least of these three, and I can tell you a little bit about each one of them. Uh, Data Airlines is focused on chip tune and 8-bit sounds. It's from uh, France. I think it's managed by Dubmood, if I'm not mistaken. And they they are commercial. They sell records and stuff like that. And but most of their artists are, are uh, demo scene artists or chip tune artists. Uh, then you have Miasma, and Miasma actually started as a net label. Uh, label and uh, then it uh, restarted its catalog as an official record label trying to cut his their ties from the demo scene somewhat to give a, give a more professional image somehow and uh, Tokyo Dawn Records did something similar they actually started as a music group it's one of the oldest music groups uh, they released a lot of mod music from a lot of different artists and at some point when the mp3 net label craze started showing up, they decided to, okay, let's stop the old catalog of mods, let's restart the catalog just releasing MP3s, and a few years later they decided, okay, let's cut that catalog as well, it's, it didn't exist, it's like prior catalog, let's start a new catalog fresh just doing CDs. So now they just do CD stuff with a new bunch of artists, I don't think there are many related or still related to the demo scene, but yeah. And it's, it's curious to see the, how these labels evolved. And some of them try to hide their demo scene background and others are proud of it. So it's, it's, it's curious, I don't know. Um, anyways, that's it. That's all I had to uh, tell to you about. I hope you guys learned a bit more about net audio, what it is and how it's related to the demo scene somewhat. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I am available to answer now or later. So thank you. So does does anyone have any questions? Okay. 
how do you found a net label? Uh, well, uh, you need a web page and you need a place to upload your tracks. There are some free places where you can upload your tracks. Uh, some people just use Bandcamp, for example. You can put on Bandcamp, uh, pay what you want. So it's free for download. It's officially a net label. So there are a lot of net labels nowadays that just use a Bandcamp profile. Some people uh, apply to other resources. I can list you the name of resources available for net labels. You have archive.org. They have a net label section. You have scene.org. It also has a net label section, although they might be picky if you're demo scene related or not. You have uh, sonicsquirrel.net, uh, which also is free to upload your content there. And then you have a few not so free, but uh, it, it, it's a nice way to distribute your music. You have, for example, SoundCloud, Bandcamp that we already talked about, and I, I think that's it. I can't think of any. Oh, you have free music archive as well. That's an interesting place to put. Since I started putting uh, enough records catalog, a free music archive, uh, it started, uh, we started getting a lot more requests from random video artists looking for uh, soundtracks for their videos because they use uh, Free Music Archive as a source to find stuff with Creative Commons licenses that lets them use them. So it's, uh, I would recommend people to check it out. Okay, any other questions? No, that's it. Okay. Thank you again and uh, see you around.